Good morning. morning. A special welcome to uh, you as we gather here. Uh, A special welcome to those who are joining us via live stream. Um, Some of, uh, we've been made aware that our connection uh, was not real good. Uh, We had this computer hooked up to wireless. And so over this past week, we've hooked it up uh, wired. So it's hardwired in. And so hopefully, those who are joining us via live stream are uh, able to have the whole service, not just little snippets here and there. So uh, we've done that work this week, so hopefully uh, that will bless those who are joining us via live stream. This morning, we continue in our uh, Advent uh, series, uh, the waiting. We've been looking at waiting in different aspects, and so uh, our call to worship this morning comes with the litany, and uh, a litany again that uh, calls us here. Waiting in joy. What are you waiting for? Light shines in the righteous and and joy in the upright in the heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise His holy name. Where is your joy? Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. You may know to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Joy even in our pain or in our questions? In the midst of a very severe trial, we are overflowing joy and an extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones of the dead crushed rejoice. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a So what brings joy in God? Joy to God. Joy comes with our salvation. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song. With joy you will draw water from wells of salvation. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his throne. What are you waiting for? I invite the Zimmer family to lay our Advent candles. Advent is a time of waiting. We wait in hope. We wait, we wait in peace. As we wait, we are filled with joy, not because our lives are perfect, not because we don't have any struggles, but because we find our strength in God, the God of our salvation. We are joyful because God sent God's Son, Jesus Christ, into the world so we may be saved. Today we light the candle of joy, As we wait, let us be people of joy.
I know someone who could do Spanish, but not French. We come to God's Word as we focus as, um, as um, Braxton turned us towards our focus on joy, uh, we hear these words from Psalm 84. Psalm 84, the psalmist writes, How lovely is your dwelling place, O God of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Let's bow our heads and join our hearts in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you. We come seeking your face. God, we thank you that you have, uh, you have invited us into this place to meet with you. You've promised where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in their midst. So God, you are here in our midst, and we give praise for you. Lord, we thank you for your dwelling place. God, we, we know that long ago in, in, in a certain place, there was a temple that, in which you dwelt. God, now you dwell in your people. You dwell by your Spirit, the Spirit that was poured out upon those who believed in Jesus, who confessed with their mouth, Jesus the Lord, believed in their heart that, God, you raised your Son from the dead. And so, God, you poured out your Spirit, and, and your people became the dwelling place. Indeed, it is lovely to meet, to gather together as your people gather in this place where you are and to give you praise, to rejoice as the psalmist says. Lord, we confess that sometimes our longing is not what the psalmist confesses. Sometimes we want to be elsewhere. Sometimes we don't want to gather. Sometimes we don't want the things that remind us of you, and God, we confess that. We confess our pain that distracts us. We confess our suffering that takes up all of our energy. God, we confess those things before you. And we ask, Lord, that you, by your Spirit, would renew us. Renew us to be like the psalmist, that our soul longs deeply to gather as your people to worship you, that it even faints. If we don't have it, Lord, that we would be nothing. God, give us your presence. Give us your people. Lord, May we truly confess with the psalmist that our hearts and our flesh sing for joy to you as we gather in this place. Lord, set our desire on you and fill us with your joy. Father, we pray this all in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
David. This morning we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 40. So I invite you to turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. It's often, Isaiah chapter 40 is often a passage that is read around Christmas time, um, and it's a passage that, um, like John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist takes upon his own lips uh, the, the words of Isaiah 40, a voice in the wilderness, a voice says, cry, what shall I cry? And um, it, it, so John the Baptist takes these words, uh, uses these words, but this is also, um, Isaiah 40 is the turning point of Isaiah, the prophecy Isaiah, um, of Isaiah, uh, where it shifts from judgment, uh, and the, the message shifts from judgment to a, a shift of hope. And so this is the chapter where um, the prophet shifts to a, a a voice of hope to the people, and so often read uh, around Christmas time. We're going to read the first eleven verses. Let's uh, let's go to God in time of prayer. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you before this Your Word, which was given, which was willed, which was given, which was inspired by you, Holy Spirit. God, as you inspired Isaiah to write these words, the very words that you gave him to give to the people of old, you also give, inspired him to give them to us today. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes that we might see Open our ears that we might hear and make our heart receptive to your word. Not that we would just take it blindly, but that we would decipher, we would discern, we would dig into your word to mine the jewels that are there, that we might be trusting and that we might be knowing. God, we pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Psalm, or uh, Isaiah 40, 1 through 11. This is God's word for us this morning. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare, or if you look below, it says hardship, that her warfare or hardship is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and a rough place is a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the breath of the Lord blows on it. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Go on up to the to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of, heralder of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and in his arm rules, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word.
when I was a kid or, well, a little after that, there, were a, there was kind of a time where there were some TV shows or so, a thread of shows that c- kind of became popular. They were, uh, in a sense, kind of the, the uh, reality shows. And the reality shows that I'm, in particular, that I'm thinking about are these shows that would do, um, do makeovers. Um, sometimes they were called extreme makeovers, and, and they focused on a person, or sometimes they, uh, they would get, uh, people would uh, give or send recommendations or apply to have a home for a loved one, or uh, sometimes they would do it for veterans, or sometimes they would do it for uh, people who who had a lot of adopted families, and they would make over their home in seven days. Makeovers. Makeovers. They would remake this house, and, and right, they even did it with people. You know, a new look, a new outlook. Well, Isaiah wrote to a people lost in sin, Right? Their sin had become such a part of their lives that there was no way of redemption without a total makeover. Right? The world that they lived in, the world they knew, needed a total remodel because they were so caught up in their sin. Sin had been, become such a part of their lives that every system that they lived in, their religious system and their home system and their governmental system, it was all, all lost in sin. Right? In a nutshell, this is what the prophet Isaiah's book really describes. It's a makeover. And the makeover Isaiah details wasn't a pleasant sprucing up or a whole new look for a loved one. It didn't happen in seven days. The makeover Isaiah spoke of was death, destruction, and exile. All of those things, death, destruction, and exile, were a part of his prophecy. And for the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, you will, you will read that, you will see that, right? You will see this death, destruction, and exile that came as a, part of, as a result of their sin or as a result of the people's sins collectively. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria, the northern kingdom in Samaria was the capital. In 722 BC, Samaria fell to the Assyrians. It was prophesied. God said, if you continue in your sin, you will lose the promised land. He said that from the very beginning, before they even went into the promised land. And in 722 BC, Israel, Samaria fell to the Assyrians. And the people were brought out of there and brought into exile. In 586, the southern kingdom, Judah, Right? Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. And the same, the people were carried out of their land, their temple was destroyed, and they were brought into exile. And you wonder if Isaiah's prophetic words of judgment and wrath rang in their ears as they were carried off into a different land, carried off into a different system, carried off into a different place. And as they were deported, you wondered if, if, Isaiah's, if Isaiah's words rang in their ears. Because as they were carried off, what the people saw and what the people experienced was, was that they were destined to a harsh existence in a land that was unknown to them. And 
You know, I say, we, we use these pleasant words, they were carried off into exile. If you read some of the accounts of the way the Assyrians treated their, uh, their uh, enemies and the people that they conquered, they literally put hooks in their noses and they pulled them, right? It was, it was terrible. I think we could say people, God's people in this time were broken physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Life was hard. Life was toilsome. And it was into this hard life of toil. It was into this life of brokenness that the words of Isaiah 40 were directed. Right? In Isaiah 40 come words of hope to a broken people. A broken people that are headed into a foreign land, right? To live hard lives, toilsome lives, wondering about, wondering about their whole life. Wondering if God was even, even existed anymore, if God was with them. It's into that life that the words of Isaiah were directed. Comfort, comfort my people. Now, at first light or at first value, at face value, one might say, well, just words of comfort and comfort, that might, those, might, those are empty words. How can one cry comfort to an utterly broken people in the midst of a life of toil in a land that is far from what they know? Well, the comfort comes from God's words in verse 2. Words in Verse 2, which says, which God says through the prophet, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, speak tenderly to God's people that her warfare, her hardship is ended. It's ended. In other words, in other words, God sees and God knows the sufferings of his people, and there's an end in sight. All the toil, all the hard life God's people have endured, it has an expiration date. It says, God says, God says, the, speak tenderly, her warfare or hardship is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received double or received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. There's an end in sight. There's an expiration date. Sin and iniquity has been forgiven. And, and not only has the iniquity been forgiven, causing what's the iniquity, causing their hardship and toil to expire, right? The, the sin has been forgiven, which has caused their hardship and toil to expire. But faithfully enduring the life of exile means that life is also set for a double serving of blessing, right? The iniquity has been forgiven, which causes that that hardship and toil to expire. And and in in God's people that faithfully endure a life of exile means that that life is set to receive a double serving a double serving of God's blessing. Isaiah says, God's people have received from the Lord's hand double for all their sins. So how is this comfort assured? How is the comfort and promise of blessing assured? Well, well, Isaiah in his in his prophecy, as he's uh, giving these inspired words to a people who are destined for exile, Isaiah says, Isaiah says, God shows up. 
Right? God shows up. In verses three through five, we see God showing up on the scene. Amid the hardship and amid the toil, amid the sufferings and the labor, God shows up. Right? A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God shows up. He shows up to assure the people of comfort. He shows up to assure the people of forgiveness. He shows up to assure the people of blessing beyond what they deserve. And God works much the same way today. He works much the same way today. The comfort, forgiveness, and blessing we are called to possess as people of God today come because God shows up. We have this confession in our church that asks us about comfort. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I'm not my own but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? Why? He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood. He has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work for my good or together for my salvation. And because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life, makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. God shows up. God shows up to bring comfort. God shows up to bring forgiveness. God shows up to bring blessing. Right? Comfort in this life of toil. Forgiveness for the sins of this life of toil. And the blessing of Christ along the way. Something that is Something that is given to us, the inheritance of Christ, beyond what we can even imagine, is given to us along the way. So what is the comfort that God gives? Well, one commentator says the comfort God gives is not just an encouraging pat on the back or some kind words. God doesn't show up just to, just to say, you can do it. I believe in you. No, that's not the comfort that God gives. First, we see God gives power and strength for the journey. It's in verse 11. The comfort that God gives or God shows up to give, in verse 11, God gives power and strength for the journey. Notice God did not immediately take his people out of exile. Like some, right, God didn't immediately uh, have this evacuation plan, this salvation plan that takes them right out of this life of exile. God's plan of comfort did not include an immediately, uh, an immediate uh, teleportation out of one life and into another. God comes to them where they are and gives them what they need in the time that they are in. Right? Judah was destroyed and, and Judah was, Jerusalem was destroyed and Judah was taken into exile in 586 BC. The first wave of the exiles that returned came back in 538. 
48 years later. The last wave of exiles that returned came back in 445 B.C., 141 years later. God's plan of comfort wasn't this teleportation out of the life and into a new one. God came to give strength for the journey. God comes to give strength. The comfort which Isaiah spoke of was the promise of God's presence in exile with the people. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather their lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently leads those that are with young. God comes to be. God comes to give comfort in the time. Second, we see God brings to nothing the enemies of God's people. What is this comfort of God? What is the comfort God gives? He gives strength in the time and in the place. And second, he brings to nothing the enemies. Verses 6 through 8 is a poetic description of what will become of the armies, of the enemies of God's people. Right? particular 7 through 8 the grass withers and the flower fades but the breath of the lord when the breath of the lord blows on it surely the people are grass the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of the lord will, or word of god will stand forever here's this poetic description of what will become of the enemies of god's people they will wither and they will fade at god's will Does God use them? Does God use them for this makeover of his people? Does God use them uh, as his his means of judgment? Does God use these enemies? Of course he does, but they're at his will. And the truth is that judgment is not God's final word. Destruction is not God's final word. The enemies of God's people will wither and fade at God's will. And third, we see that God's promises will forever stand. In verse verse 8, right? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. God showing up, God showing up to give strength in the time and in the place. God shows up in comfort to, to assure uh, his people that their enemies will be gone, that, that God is in charge, and God shows up to remind his people that his promises are sure, that there's an end date to the toil. That the enemies are destroyed. That God comes to shepherd his people. Congregation of God, the same comfort is assured to us. We just need to take again another look at, take another look at question and answer one. This came comfort is assured to us. I belong in life and in death to a faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins. Right? There is an end date to, to living and belonging to myself, belonging to the toil. There's an end date to it, to uh, living a life of sin and destruction, headed for, headed, for, well, headed for the place without God. There's an end date to that, and there's an end date to when Jesus will return and take us into the glory. There's an end date. The enemies of God will be destroyed. 
right? Christ has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and set me free from the tyranny of the devil. The enemies of God come to nothing. The enemies of God come to nothing. And God comes to shepherd his people. Jesus showed up. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. He watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. He comes to shepherd his people. The promises of God in Christ for us, our comfort is assured. But in this comfort for this life, we're called to to be and to do some things. Catechism says that Christ by his Assure, uh, by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life, makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. The, the people of Isaiah's time were called to do some things in the, in, the, in the promises of God, in the comfort of God, right? They were called to work so that the glory of God is revealed. Verse 5. Right? Or verse 4 and 5. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain hill made low, the uneven ground become level, the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. They were called to live a life in exile for the glory of God. to do whatever they, uh, their ability was, whatever God gave them to do, to take away the distractions from the glory of God, even in the midst of a life of toil and hardship. They were called to prepare the way of the king. In verse 9 and 10, They were called to declare the good news. To to continually declare the good news, right? It says, go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say, Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Right? They were called to work at declaring the good news to one another and to the world. What's the good news? God is just. God is a God of promises. God is a God of comfort. Now you might say, that's all fine and great, but still, Still, it was a life of toil. It was a life. It was a life living, never knowing when God's promises would come, never knowing when God would show up. It was still a life of hardship. It was still a life of toil. It was still this kind of life. If you turn with me to the last verse of Isaiah 40. Isaiah gives this wonderful picture of God. Gives this wonderful picture of God to the people in exile. And, and he says, have you not known, this is verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. 
The people in exile waited, waited for God to show up. They waited to be able to return to their home. They waited for the assurance of God's promise of hope to come. Further on, God's people waited. They waited for this Savior. They waited in anticipation for years upon years upon years. For 400 some years after they returned from the exile, they waited for Jesus, the Son of God, to come. They waited in hope. They waited. They waited in hope. And God gave them strength in their waiting. This Advent season reminds us that we wait in hope. Not for the first coming of Christ. He's already come, right? We have the scriptures that tell us about him. We have the scriptures that tell us how we belong to Jesus, body and soul in life and in death. We have that, that Jesus Christ gave his blood, that Jesus Christ died, was buried, was raised again, and we're awaiting him to come, and we wait. And we have to say that in this waiting there is toil. We get discouraged We sometimes tend to, to say with the psalmist, from, with David from Psalm 13, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemies be exalted over me? We, we wait in a life of toil. But people of God, wait in hope. Wait in hope. Wait in the strength that God gives you to get through the journey. Wait because God shows up. He showed up for our salvation in sin, from sin. He'll show up again because His promises are forever true. Wait in hope. Receive the strength of God. Those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we are so grateful for your word. We identify ourselves and we can feel We can feel with those people of old, people walking in a life of toil and hardship. We can look around us, we see the sin of the world, we see see the work of the devil. Even our own sin sticks to us, God. It's a life of hardship and it's a life of toil. But I I pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see beyond that, that you would give us ears to hear the message of Isaiah, comfort, 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 comfort for my people, says your God. God, give us comfort in this life by giving us strength. Strength to hold on to your promises. Strength to live for your glory. Strength to declare the good news. God, your son Jesus Christ, he came and he died. And he gave his life for us. That one day, all of this, all of this will be made new. We will be made new God, we pray that we would never lose sight of that, that we would take comfort in that fact and that you, in our waiting and hope, would give us strength for that journey. Father, we pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Let's sing together soon and very soon. Let's stand to sing.
Ele. Let's let's uh, go to God in a time of prayer for uh, our uh, in our congregational prayer. There's a few things that I want to mention. Um, was brought to my attention a nephew of Marge and Florence, uh, Ken Visser, who lives in Washington State. Right? Is that right? Uh, he is on a ventilator, and uh, so we'll remember him. Um, some of you know a fellow colleague in the classes, uh, uh, Arlen Kopendreyer. I think he's come and he's preached here. Um, as of late, he kind of looks like Einstein with his hair. He's, you know, um, Arlen had a, uh, uh, a severe stroke. I got word last night from Pastor Steve that Arlen had a, um, a massive stroke, and he's in the St. Cloud Hospital and uh, as of last night, prognosis was not looking good. Uh, so we'll pray for Arlen and um, his family and uh, Trinity Hill Church, uh, which he uh, serves as a church planner and pastor. So um, let's, uh, let's go to God in a time of prayer. Almighty God, you are a great God, a God who is involved in the life and in, in your creation. You didn't just create things to be and set them in motion and then step back to see what would happen by chance or what, what, might, what might come. You're a God who is alive and active. God, we confess you're, you're not a God who needs your creation, you don't need us, but out of your love you created and you brought this world into motion. You said, let there be light, and there was light. You brought seasons, you brought plants, you brought animals, you called forth from the dust humans, men and women created in your image created to know you. God, you are a God who is great and awesome, a God who is, is present in this life. And even despite the disobedience and despite sin coming into the world, you gave a promise and you, you gave your word that there would be a day where sin would be taken care of it would be redeemed. The enemy would be destroyed. And you set your people on a path of waiting. Waiting. Faithfully trusting you. And God, as your scripture tells us and as your scripture displays, the, the, the many people who trusted, who waited on you and in whom you gave strength, in whom you gave life and you watched over them and you fulfilled your promises to them. And they live for us as examples. And their stories go on and testimonies go on as examples for us. And you call us to wait too. God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for how you you bring it into our lives. We're thankful for that we can listen, that we can read and discern and grow deeper in love with you and deeper in love with one another. Forgive us, Lord, when our desires are on something else. Bring us back to you. God, we come with thanksgiving in our heart for the season, the season of Advent, the season that points us to, to Jesus, uh, to remember Jesus' first coming and to anticipate Jesus' second. God, when Christ comes back, we pray that you would find us to be faithful people, enduring this life in your strength and in faith that is wholly grounded in you by the work of your Spirit. God, we thank you for the opportunity as a church to, to lift up those who, whom we love and 
who are a part of the lives of the people that we love. Lord, on this day, we, we bring before you Ken Visser, and Lord, as he's on a ventilator, and Lord, we don't know the details, but we entrust him to you, a God who does, a God who sees, a God who knows, a God who is uh, sovereign over all. Lord, we, we lift him up to you. We pray for his family, his close family, his extended family, for those he loves. May, may you use him uh, to testify to your goodness and mercy. Lord, if it be your will, heal his body, touch him, that he might know and others might see that. See your mighty hand. God, we pray for Arlen Kopendreyer as he has um, suffered a stroke. Lord, we pray that you would bless him. Uh, we don't know, uh, again, we don't know the details, but we ask that you would bless, give healing, give uh, protection from further damage, or that you, would, that you would use him and use this time to your glory, that, you, that that might be revealed, or be with his, his family, be with them as they stand by him and encourage him and, Lord, all of that. Be with the doctors and nurses as they minister to him. Be with his church as they uh, await news. And, and, God, strengthen them in this time in their life of prayer and their life of trust and faith in you. Father, we lift up those who, uh, who are a part of our congregation that we love and Lord, there's future tests in the life of Calvin and Mike. Lord, um, what those look like, we don't know. What the outcomes will be, we don't know. But God, again, as the songwriter says, we don't know who holds tomorrow, but we know, or we don't know uh, what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And so God, help us to trust. Lord, thank you for uh, the uh, the, the, the answered prayers in the life of Alan. Lord, we continue to lift up Deborah as she receives cancer treatments and her family as well as they walk through that with her. Lord, give strength and energy. Give a quality of life that, uh, Lord, that blesses her and her family and also brings glory to you. Lord, we pray for Ron in his time with cancer. Lord, we pray for Emma as she gets around and, and, and is in need of strength and, and all of those blessings, God, we pray for her. Same for Ari, Lord, for, uh, for the regaining of, of mobility and the regaining of strength, Lord, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. For Mac, too, Lord, as he's gone from a time in the hospital to a to being uh, in bed, to being able to sit in a chair and feed himself. God, we, we see uh, your uh, answers to prayers and your mighty work. And God, we pray that you would continue to bless him. And Layla and Reynolds and Geneva and Sharon and George, Lord, each one in, in need of uh, of uh, individual uh, blessings and care and strength and endurance. God, we pray for them. Lord, we pray for our shut-ins. And we ask that you would bless them as they're not able to do the things that they once did. But God, they're able to praise you. They're able to speak with you. They're able to pray and, and to interact uh, with your people. And so, God, we, we give you thanks for that. May they be uh, continue, Lord, to be a blessing to us and we a blessing to them. Lord, for those who have lost loved ones, we pray that you would um, guard their hearts and their minds. Give them the peace that passes understanding. Uh, trust in you. And, Lord, that, that the hope that we have in Jesus Christ uh, who is the way, the truth, and the life, would not, would not hinder 
their faith and their walk with you. Father, we are grateful for a congregational meeting that will happen after this worship service. We're thankful for the way you are faithful in calling forth your people to serve and to serve well. God, we pray that as we discuss things such as the budget and, and projects and, and, and all of that, God, that it would be towards the mission of this church, that it would be uh, to declare you as God and we are your people, to declare our trust in Christ, to declare the good news of a life lived in him. God, we pray that all of that would show um, Show your love for us and our love for you. Father, uh, we are thankful for the opportunity to give. We do that in worship, not because we think you need something or because we can add to you, but, but because we worship you. All things are from you. The blessings that we have are from you. And so, God, we give out of gratitude in our hearts, worshiping you. Father, we pray this all. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. I invite the deacons forward to receive our offering. I invite you to stand to receive the blessing, and as you do that, I want to remind you that tonight is the candlelight service uh, here. Uh, the Jam is um, hosting that and putting that on, uh, and uh, this wonderful worship time of worship to God. Uh, we're also uh, having communion, uh, and so you are invited back to participate um, in the Lord's Supper on that night. Uh, on tonight. So invite you back. As you go from this place, the blessing of God is upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen.
minutes and we'll get ready for the congregational meeting. If you're going to go out, make sure you're back. I heard 10 minutes, right? 10 minutes. So we look forward to that.